Hello, and welcome to uh, this, uh, the Disrupt Film Series presentation of Gold Mafia. I'm Bruce Roeder, president and founder of the Museum of Political Corruption, and we're going to have a spectacular conversation uh, today about, uh, about this compelling documentary. But before we do that, we commemorate uh, that this is International Anti-Corruption Day. And as we've done in years past, today is the day that we announce the inductees into the Museum of Political Corruption's Hall of Honor and Hall of Shame. So without any further ado, let's begin with the Hall of Shame inductees. We have uh, Rod uh, Blagojevich, former governor of Illinois. Uh, Blagojevich was convicted by a federal grand jury on charges of extortion, as well as a pay to play scheme involving the corrupt use of his authority to fill the United States Senate seat that had been vacated by Barack Obama's presidential victory. Ray Nagan, who served as the 60th mayor of New Orleans, he was indicted on 21 corruption charges, including wire fraud, conspiracy, and bribery. Sheldon Silver, he was the powerful speaker of the New York State Assemblyman, Assemblyman uh, from 1994 to 2015. He was arrested in 2015 on federal corruption charges related to an elaborate kickback scheme. James Anthony Trafficant Jr was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Ohio. He was indicted on charges of bribery, obstruction of justice, conspiracy to defraud the United States, and filing a false tax return. He was the fifth representative ever to be expelled from the U.S. House of Representatives. And George Santos. The web of lies caught up to George Santos this year. He served in the U.S. House of Representatives from New York's 3rd District. A House Ethics Committee investigation revealed that Santos, quote, sought to fraudulent, fraudulently exploit every aspect of his House candidacy for his own personal financial benefit. Santos became only the sixth representative to face expulsion from the House. Now let's turn to the good side. And let's speak of those who have, we have now inducted into our Hall of Honor. John Dean. John Dean served as White House counsel under President Richard Nixon from 1970 to 73. Implicated in the Watergate scandal, Dean's cooperation with the Senate Watergate Committee resulted in a fuller understanding of the extent of the Watergate cover-up and Nixon's own participation. This is the first time that we've ever elected an entire organization to join the Hall of Honor, and it is appropriate. Uh, the Select Committee to Investigate the January 6th Attack on the United States Capitol. Under the leadership of Representatives Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney, the January 6th Committee worked diligently, often under difficult circumstances, to uncover the circumstances surrounding the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. G. Robert Blakey, prosecutor and legal scholar. Blakey was instrumental in drafting the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt, Corrupt Organization Act, known as RICO, of 1970. We've also inducted this year Andy Borowitz, uh, the satirist with rapier wit. Andy uh, has been entertaining and enlightening audiences for a decade. His acclaimed satirical, satirical column, The Borowitz Report, frequently turn, turned today's headlines into humor to present insightful commentary on government, ethics, and social justice. We've also inducted Carrie Chapman Catt, the suffragist who succeeded Susan B. Anthony as president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Simply put, Cat strengthened democracy in the United States by giving women the vote. And lastly, our Nellie Bly award winner this year, Anna Wolf. Anna Wolf is an investigative reporter for Mississippi Today who covers inequity and corruption in government safety net programs. Wolf's back channel series helped expose the diversion 
of at least 77 million in funds that were intended to assist the state's poorest residents. And with that, we turn now to the Disrupt Film Series presentation of Gold Mafia that we have for you today. Uh, the Disrupt Film Series, uh, under the direction of filmmaker and documentarian Ver Veronica Medina, has presented over these past couple of years many uh, wonderful, compelling, and informative uh, documentaries that deal with corruption and social injustice. And we are pleased to continue that uh, again this morning. This morning, uh, at this time, I am pleased to introduce to you the moderator for uh, for today's discussion, Morgan Piem. Morgan uh, is a filmmaker and journalist, as well as an MPC advisory board member, and we are delighted uh, that he will be uh, moderating today's event. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Gold Mafia and to uh, to lead this panel discussion. I'm going to be joined by Sarah Yosen, who is with Al Jazeera's investigative unit, and she's also the co-director and co-producer of Gold Mafia. Um, we're also joined by Dawood Khan, who is a whistleblower extraordinaire um, with a really incredible story and was really the part of the beating heart of this series, uh, it, really extraordinary. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about his experience. And Dominic Wabala, who is an investigative reporter from Kenya, who uh, has done landmark work in investigating the, <clears throat> the scandal that was at the heart of this film. Uh, and he is one of the leading voices for investigative journalism in this country. So it is a, a great honor to be joined by Sarah, Dominic, and Dawood. Um, I would say that um, given my association with the Museum of Political Corruption, I guess I wasn't surprised to find out just how corrupt the gold industry was, but I was really blown away by um, the extraordinary journalism uh, at the heart of this series and your ability to expose it so vividly. So I wanted to just start off by asking, Sarah, how did this series originate and, and how did your investigation take shape? Thanks, Morgan, and thank you so much for having us on this and featuring Gold Mafia. Um, I think the investigation began very far from where it is today. It began as a wildlife investigation into wildlife trafficking. Um, we received information from sources that the airport in Harare, Zimbabwe, was very porous, and through there, lots of um, wildlife and like ivory and things like that were going through the airport but what we also found out was um that there were these couriers it, it began with these group of couriers who were traveling on these flights these emirates flights from harare to dubai and they were traveling in a very strange manner they would take maybe seven to ten flights a month they would get on a plane from harare fly to dubai stay at the airport for an hour or two and take the same plane back. So this was a nine hour flight one way and they're doing it back and forth about 10 times a month. So we had our uh, surveillance operations um, and what we found out, was we managed to get hold of some manifests, flight manifests and tallied up the number of flights that these people were doing and we found out that they were carrying gold. Now this was very interesting because it just seems like an unusual way to carry such an uh, in-demand commodity out of the country. And for us to find out that this was actually papered, as they call it, or legal. So, and th that's how it began at the airport in Harare. And um, Dominic, if you can talk about your background in, investing the, in investigating the Goldenberg scandal and just how your involvement, uh, how it intersects with Kenya. Uh, this, the golden the golden back scandal ha happened uh, in between 1991 and 1993, and it is estimated that the that the the, the fraud uh, the country lost about 2.3 billion US dollars during that time, and it was about uh, export compensation. Uh, it, it, these was uh, were policies that were introduced in the in the Kenyan government, in, in which uh, Patney and his ilk, his corrupt politicians. Uh, I realized there was a loophole. So what uh, 
what happened was that he purported to have been exporting gold outside the country and uh, for that because of the exchange rate the, 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 the fluctuation of the exchange rate and all that the government then would compensate him for the exports that he had sent out there interestingly kenya did not have the any you know such an amount of gold as to warrant the type of compensation he was getting at that time so then uh, 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 there were so many senior government officials, Kenyan government officials that were involved in that sc scandal then. So they, uh, in 2003, there was an inquiry, a, a, a judicial inquiry into his activities at that point of time. When that was happening, he implicated quite a number of people, politicians, the judiciary, security, and everybody out as having been part of the beneficiaries of what he was benefiting from that time. Then uh, along the way, uh, he, as, as, as the inquiry was going on, he was in and out of prison, uh, police custody in court and all that. Then he fizzled out a bit. And uh, the next time I heard of him was when in Zimbabwe, when he was actually in, 20, to, in November 2018, he was actually detained in Zimbabwe airport. And uh, the then uh, Zimbabwean police uh, spokesperson Charity Chiremba confirmed that they had arrested him and released him. He was on his way from Dubai, from sorry, from Zimbabwe to uh, Dubai. So when 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 these uh, when uh, when the Al Jazeera uh, investigative uh, piece on on his uh, activities came up, it was voila. I mean, it, there's nothing new about him. We know that he has been involved in this thing for quite a long time. We right. ask him. And, you know, for those who didn't watch the series or or, uh, or just saw part of it, I mean, what this investigation does is it implicates um, the president of, of Zimbabwe, um, the former president of South Africa, so many world leaders, and, and really what the film postulates, and I would argue really demonstrates, is that um, the, the gold mafia and this illegal enterprise really exists at a level higher than the government itself, or at least the governments of uh, all these countries are in service of this larger criminal enterprise. And, and what's so extraordinary is the way that um, on mostly on, on hidden camera, how you're able to get so many of these key players uh, to confess quite openly about their involvement in the scandal. Um, Sarah, can you talk about how you were able to get people to participate in the sting operation, a little bit about your cover story and, and the mechanics of how you were able to pull this off? Sure. Um, so all our undercover operations are always informed. In this case, it was informed by um, a, a lot of documents that we've received by amazing whistleblowers, amazingly brave whistleblowers like Dawood, who informed us on you know how operations work. So we go in knowing, um, having a fair idea of how things work. And so that informs us on what legends the undercover reporters take on, what sort of personalities they take on um, to, to best get um, our subjects talking. And um, for example, with uh, Kamlesh Patni, um, it, it, this was after the, the first meeting was after COVID and we had since spoken to his, uh, someone who was his accountant. We had gone through the ledgers, we, we knew how the operations worked. So when we approached him, we, we knew what we were going to hear, but I think we weren't ready for how open he was going to be. A lot of these conversations turned out to be masterclasses into corruption, into political corruption. They kind of offered these blueprints on their operations on the platter. There was no uh, reservation. It, it seemed to be a sense of immunity, like they couldn't be touched. Um, Another interesting undercover operation was with a character called Ambassador Ubit Angel. He is an ambassador for Zimbabwe, an ambassador at large, who is also a pastor, and he claims to be a um, prophet as well. Um, he was basically tasked with bringing business into Zimbabwe within a small two-week window and this was during cop 26 the un climate change conference we were just meeting at the fringes he was there accompanying the zimbabwean president um to to this he was part of the delegation 
Now, we've always heard about, you know, backdoor deals being done at international conferences, but for a journalist to be able to see firsthand these things that we've suspected and heard of, it's, it's something else. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was just extraordinary. And uh, Hubert Angel is just documentary gold for us uh, filmmakers and journalists. Uh, what an over-the-top character. And, you know, I was just thinking about the extraordinary risk that you all would be putting yourselves at given the the people that you're tangling with at the highest level. And um, I was just so taken aback by Dawood's courage uh, as a whistleblower. And, um, and then I was not, I, I guess... Uh, I, it only really came into perspective at the end of the series when uh, Dawa talked about that he has been, um, you know, the the victim of multiple assassination attempts for his courage. And so, Dawa, maybe you could talk about how you became a whistleblower and how your life has intersected with this extraordinary tale. Hi, Morgan. Uh I basically came into this life by association of, not even association, but family, family ties, blood family ties. My brother brought me to his business into the early years of 2011. I joined his company along with a business partner of his of a Pakistani national by the name of Suhail Jivani. And through my interpretation and my journey of entering their world, I started to understand that I was employed to come and work in the financial sector for them in deriving and, and creating a banking operation for the two of them. And obviously utilizing my almost 10 years in a financial sector with both one of South Africa's big financial institutions as a benefit towards their strategy in getting things uh, onto the road and, and playing evenly with the bigger players in the market. And it, as I started, intersecting certain bits of information through their conversations, through WhatsApps, as well as certain documents that I would come across either in their offices or in their homes. It became more openly transparent to myself that they weren't exactly uh, interacting in the normal chain of commands for financial transactions. And you know, as a family member and looking at your brother as well as his business partner and being in their homes with their families, you almost want to turn a blind eye. But at such a stage, at the, at the time, I had to come to terms that they were actually doing money laundering. The money laundering at that specific time had nothing to do with the gold mafia or the individuals that's mentioned through this documentary, but far more... Uh, if I could say bigger volumes, a bigger network of various uh, nationals that are based in South Africa and throughout Southern Africa. And in some extent, we had certain individuals from all over the world that were just pumping volumes of cash that needed to be laundered at specific points around the globe. And my brother basically said, listen, you, you are learning what's happening and you are seeing things. And one of the very first opportunities that he invited me into this whole world was a, a evening meeting that happened at a very famous hotel in Johannesburg called the Michelangelo, where they met with an individual by the name of uh, Dauri Brand. And I was, you know, sitting in the same room with this individual, not knowing who he is. And like Sarah mentioned earlier, it's like a bragging right where my brother would keep on saying, you know who this is, you know who this is. Then only afterwards did he start saying, Dowdy Brian, Dowdy Brian. And for me, the only thing that I could think was name, association, Dowd and Dowd, and that was it. And he asked me to Google the name. And when I Google the name, I see one of the FBI's most wanted individuals, an actual terrorist that's sitting here right in front of me having conversations with mom, but, but actually more with Soil Giovanni. And that basically opened up my eyes to the type of characters and the involvement that they were particip participating with in South Africa stages in Dubai and all over the world. I 
basically stayed with Mohammed for almost seven years through various transactions and activities that happened legitimately and illegitimately within this business. And you know, from my side, basically Mohammed and I, we started having a major fallout almost about five years into me working for him, where I could say, honestly, it was like at the breaking point. And already he knew that I'm not an individual that's just going to sit back and, and, and take things as is. And obviously with the threats that he was directing at myself as well as towards my family, at a much later stage, Mohammed and I parted ways and a common denominator, one of his very good friends, also an attorney that represented him through several uh, methods. I went to him and said, listen, let me talk. I am, he said, people want to talk to you. I said, I've got the information. I've always said I'll talk. And basically, Mohammed and this individual were in cahoots with each other. And whatever information I passed on to the authorities was basically just an understanding of what I was willing to share and how far I was willing to go. And they used that and they turned everything against me. So that's basically just a mere introduction, if I may share. I mean, I could go on for hours and hours on how and why exactly I am sitting where I am today. But the reality is, it was just at a breaking point where I had to come clean. I've been trying to talk, but as a South African, as an African, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the journalists as well as to Dominic. Uh, but in South Africa, if you have money, you've got influence. If you've got the right relationships, you basically can walk away from anything. And I didn't know who to trust in South Africa because I've seen from presidents to journalists to lawyers to policemen, everyone on the payroll of certain individuals, if not my brother and his own partner. They basically could get away with murder and no one would even bet in either. Fortunately, in my case, Alex and Sarah approached me and offered me an opportunity. And after several heavy discussions, eventually I was at the state where I had the trust in the two individuals as well as the organization to go ahead with the story. And yes, the rest is history what the series coming out. I, I mean, uh, Dawood, your story intersects with everyone from the former president of South Africa to the individual you were just talking about who was on the FBI wanted list, who has uh, been accused of, of bombings in Mumbai, right? Uh, you know, so you've dealt with people on the highest levels um, through your business affairs. Um, and the, the, the reach of the scandal is so extraordinary. Uh, it spans continents. Uh, you, at one point, you're talking about the president of Venezuela. Um, there's clearly a nexus in, in Dubai. Uh, Ernst & Young, one of the biggest uh, accounting firms in the world, um, really was a party to covering up this scandal. I mean, the tentacles of it are just so vast and, and just staggering the degree to, as you said, Dawood, basically everybody who uh, is involved seem to seemingly operates with impunity. Uh, there's no accountability. And because it's the governments themselves that are involved in it, there's no one to even hold them accountable. Um, and I was just so taken aback by, um, you know, as, as investigative journalists, obviously we, so much of our work hinges upon whistleblowers like yourself, Dawood, who have the courage to put your life at risk. You're estranged from your family, your family, your own family now is as at risk because of this. And then I'm also brought back to the fact that in our current context, uh, in, our, in our current environment in the world, we have more investigative journalists being killed than ever uh, for the courage of their work. And I wanted to ask you, Dominic, have you been subject to threats because of your investigations that you've done? And, and to what degree, you know, have you also been subject to uh, the dangers of your profession? Uh, I've been sacked twice. I have uh, been threatened. I have uh, uh, almost been killed uh, because of the kind of work you do. Because the misfortune is that, like Dowd says, uh, uh, the corrupt 
the, the gold mafias and the, the drug dealers and the likes of it have tentacles almost everywhere. So whatever you touch, you can imagine uh, you work on a golden bug story and you submit it. And 10 minutes after you have submitted it, Kamlesh calls you and asks you, Dominic, why are you writing about me? Then you go back to the system and withdraw the story and remove your name. And he says, now you have changed your name. As in you have removed your name and, 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 and put in a, a reporter instead of, of having a byline there. And, and, and this, this is something that has, uh, was, has happened to us for a long time. At some point of time, uh, quite a number of senior uh, journalists, editors, were bought for, drove cars that were bought for by Python. And, and, and that is the extent uh, of, 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 of how, 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 how well entrenched uh, he was into the system. And not only within the media houses, but even in, in the government systems. Because uh, for him to be able to, 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 to have supporting documents to confirm that he actually exported uh, uh, non-existent gold, of course. He had he had to have documentation, supporting documents show that, and he has access to those documents that they then are presented for that compensation that he gets. That he, at some point of time, uh, this uh, gentleman, or if I may call him that, has was on the forefront of trying to supposedly uh, do. Uh, to, to bring a congregation together of African chiefs and present them to uh, the later uh, Libyan president, Mohamed Gaddafi, as, uh, as, 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 as a, a representative of, of all African chiefs, you know, chiefs around the whole of Africa, so, so that uh, for, for whatever mission he wanted them to do. So this is a guy who, who had quite some influence. He had the intelligence in his hands. He had the police in his hand. The judiciary were working for him. Uh, when, when, when the commission of inquiry was happening, a prominent judge was actually implicated in having received a bribe of an expensive pair of shoes from him. Uh, the, 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 the doyen of, of opposition politics actually co confirmed that had received money from, uh, from this gentleman to, 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 uh, to, to, to be, go soft on, his, on the investigations on the critique, on the criticism on him. So for us uh, as, as journalists, as an investigative journalist, it is, it, it is, you know, you are between a rock and hard place. You have that obligation uh, to the society to expose the rock that is happening. But at the same time, there is this threat because like they say, corruption fights back and it fights back hard. And, and, and uh, um, uh, unlike, uh, un unlike uh, Sarah and, and, and 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 and, and uh, other journalists who are in established uh, media organizations, you when you mention that you are you, you are under threat, there's there's a semblance of of, of protection. Uh, there is the, the, your, your organization tries and helps you to 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 mitigate the threats. We don't have that. You on your own. Once you walk out of that newsroom, you're on your own. So it is it is your conscience. It is what you have in, within you that pushes you to. Uh, to try and expose this, because this rot is going to, to to affect the whole society. So you try your level best to try and, and and expose this and stop it. But you can only do so much. You you, you can't uh, you can't do, uh, especially when this when somebody has the backing of the government that is supposed to be fighting that rot, then it becomes uh, a bit tricky for you to do it. But somebody's got to do the job, so you do the job. Uh, I'm, that's really extraordinary, and, and I don't think anyone would dispute the fact, Dominic, that as an independent journalist, uh, not at one of these global uh, news outlets, that you are putting yourself on the line in a way that uh, you know other journalists are insulated from. But Sarah, you know, when you're doing this investigation, and as you said, um, these are folks that you're catching on your sting operation, just fully confessing to their crimes, laying it out, putting you in touch with family members of, uh, of the presidents, of multiple presidents, um, asking, soliciting a $200,000 bribe for you to sit down with the president of Zimbabwe, all because you're running under this pretense that you're trying to launder a billion dollars in money out of Hong Kong. Nobody 
you know, there is like this pretense at one point that there's an interest in where is your money from? Is this not crime? Is this not terrorism? It's not drugs. And you're like, it's not in this country that that terrorism or crime is. Involved. And they're like, OK, that's fine. Um, was there ever a point during this investigation, Sarah, that you were afraid for yourself or for your team? Or was there ever like a tense moment when you were like, we are going to be exposed, the jig is going to be up, that they must know that we are, you know, running an investigation here? Um, how, if you could talk about those dynamics. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, sure. Uh, you're right. For ex the, the example you gave with um, Ambassador Hubert Angel's crew, the diplomatic mafia, as we called them in the series, just to give it some context, that happened in a two week window. We had maybe three meetings in person tops. No family names were ever shared, no background checks. We, f we go into these um, undercover operations fully expecting to be told no and to be turned away, especially in this case, we were dealing with a representative of the government. But um, no, knowing full well that we couldn't pay a $200,000 bribe, um, what we had to do was to delay and try to spend more time with them and uncover more information. So we came out with the craziest um, requests possible. Like you said, we wanted to launder a billion dollars of dirty money. We wanted to do that by building a casino on one of the seven natural wonders of the world in, um, in Zimbabwe. But it was never no. It was when can you get us the cash? There was never that, yeah, they never stopped us. Um, there were some close calls, I guess. When we run these undercover operations, we always have a team nearby physically to make sure that if in case an extraction is needed, that would be possible, just to make sure that everyone's physically safe. Um, the other thing is, I guess, because we have the privilege of taking such a long time with these, it wasn't planned that way, but because it happened over COVID, they didn't maybe at the time put two and two together. So if we were talking to different competing groups of mafia, they wouldn't have necessarily put two and two together, say these are the same guys. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we always have, we have a safety and security protocol. We always try to keep these operations um, on our turf. It's not always possible, but we try to do that. We try to do it at our pace and in our own schedule, just to keep as much control of the situation as possible. Uh, I mean, it's really just extraordinary. The series, uh, I was really blown away by the quality of the journalism. Um, and, and I see that there's a number of questions from our audience here. And I just want to ask, um, President Manangawa, he's really at the, in a lot of ways, a, a focal point of your series, the current president of Zimbabwe, recently reelected. Um, how does that influence the ability of your series to have an impact when the people who you're exposing are still in these positions of extraordinary power? Hi. Um, there, have, there has been some impact since the series went out. Um, I believe some of the gold mafia's accounts in Zimbabwe were frozen. I'm not sure how much impact that has because a lot of their wealth, the whole point is externalized from Zimbabwe. It's in other countries. Um, we have an understanding that lots of investigations are underway. So it's in the hands of law enforcement. So we'll see where that goes. Um, uh, I understand that one of the subjects that we spoke about um, who was connected to Mohammed Khan's group uh, operations has is now under sanctions. There have been banks where staff members have been um, investigated. So things are happening slowly, but hopefully if, I think the important thing is that we keep this investigation up. Um, people are constantly coming up with more information and lots of journalists in South Africa and Zimbabwe are staying on the story. So as long as we keep it in the media, hopefully there will be more impact. Well, without a question, Sarah, you and your co-director, Alex, have certainly done your part here. Uh, and when you're talking, you know, where you're saying, Dominic, that like 
this is such a uh, dicey work and it's so dangerous and I'm sure it's so thankless at times and yet somebody has to do it. Um, you know, I guess I was thinking, yes, you're talking about sanctions, Sarah, you've talked about, you know, that there have been some kind of crackdowns around the edges. But Dawood, you also said about here you are, you're dealing with the most powerful people possible. And you have a global conspiracy. Uh, and that's not in a, you know, in a tinfoil hat way, but truly a global conspiracy of powerful actors who are all so invested in this system of corruption. And I was wondering, Dawood, like, when you decided to become a whistleblower, how did you feel like you could make an impact? Um, because I could also understand, I'm so glad that you did, but I'm saying I would also feel like a fear of a certain degree of futility about it, because how do you break through a system where all of the most powerful actors, all these powerful actors are working together and there's really very little, you know, very little impetus for anybody to take a courageous stand and to shut this down? The moment for me the biggest obstacle for me coming forward was safety for myself as well as for my family. One of the other very big obstacles I also had to overcome was how do you turn your back against your own blood and family? That, to be honest, still today you get up in the morning and you quite kind of think, did I do the right thing? Is this the right road I went on? It was very hard making those decisions. But at the very same time, I always try to play fair. I always try to be humble and just walk away and silence myself. At the very same time, these very same individuals played extremely dirty tactics towards me, towards my family. I would always just shrug it off my shoulder and try and live a quiet life with them separated away from me and my family. But it catches up. It's it's like they say, you can't keep things quiet. You go mentally insane and eventually you just have to break through. And, you know, Sarah and Alex just came at the right time where things was very unsettling in my mind and also within my family's minds on how are these guys operating with such dirty tactics towards ourselves and how do they just get away with it because you know of the money and the influences they have what do we do that could also help us in our favor to to just separate ourselves from them and the sad reality is in south africa and let me just speak as a south african and what I've experienced in South Africa. The whole world, I personally, and a lot of individuals would also favor me in this, that because of apartheid and the Nelson Mandela regime and the Rainbow Nation as South Africa is described as wonderful destination with wonderful people and we're very transparent. Throw that out the window. It's survival of the fittest in South Africa. And when I say survival of the fittest is who can make money. Everything revolves around money. Whether you are president, current sitting, previous presidents, ministers, any type of official, it all boils down to money. Where can I make money? How can I make money? And with who can I make money? What's the easiest way? And let's do it. And each and every individual of a foreign nationality that comes into South Africa looks at this and sees everything has a price in South Africa. And they take advantage of the situation and they utilize that, that benefit towards their processes of becoming rich overnight. So, you know, it's, it's fair in terms of individuals of normal reputations that want to come and hold a healthy lifestyle in South Africa, where there are many of these individuals. But there's a great many other individuals that just are completely reckless and looking for every opportunity to become famous and make money. How far would they go in terms of doing this? I mean, you've got presidents, you've got government officials, you've got authorities, you've got each and every type of position you could possibly think of that's in favor of 
utilizing something or the other towards their own personal benefit. Coming out as a whistleblower for myself, and I've made it uh, clear from the start, like Sarah said, there's a lot of individuals in the banks that's been investigated, that's been charged. All the smaller fish are going to be set examples of because Al Jazeera, Sarah, Alex has embarrassed a lot of individuals and organizations in South Africa specifically. Mm -hmm. So they will have to say we are operating and facilitating uh, prosecutions against certain individuals. But the bigger guys will never be touched. Because number one, they've got the money, they've got the relationship with the influencers, but they've got a lot of other skeletons that they also covering up for a lot of individuals that are powerful, controlling individuals don't want those skeletons coming out. So, yes, I've spoken. I didn't expect a lot, and I mentioned to Sarah and them that uh, I didn't expect any sort of prosecution towards Mohammed or a lot of the other individuals, because I know they'll get away scots free with everything, or at worst case, possibly pay a fine, but never serving any jail time. Uh, but for me, the big thing was, I won't be silenced. I can also talk. I might not be powerful. I might not be rich, but I can talk. It might be my only source of defense, and Al Jazeera has fortunately given me the opportunity to also give my side of the story because they played a lot of dirty tactics, like I've said, which they've just accused me for everything. Uh, up till today, I believe that I'm also the mastermind behind the entire gold mafia uh, conspiracy in South Africa. That's some of the rumors that's floating around. So, yeah. Um. Yes, um, you know, with uh, it, it's really extraordinary. It's like, how can you expect there to be prosecutions from a government when the government is the criminals, right? Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm so proud of being associated with the Museum of Political Corruption for is because I believe all of us who are investigative journalists believe that at the heart of all of our societal problems is political corruption. Because if you have a system that is not equitable and it's a system that is only working for the people in power, all the other problems in our society ultimately emanate from a corrupt system. Um, and when we're talking about, um, you know, I think Gold Mafia really definitely demonstrates, you know, here are massive extractions of the people's resources from their countries. You know, the idea is that you're supposed to be bringing Western currency in for vibrant uh, economy, but actually nothing is ever coming into these countries. It's only being taken away from the countries which are making people poorer. And I think that a lot of times regular folks don't understand the implications in their own lives of political corruption and how they are losing themselves. Uh, and one of the questions from our audience is about the the cost of this corruption scheme for the small scale gold miners um, are what is it what does it mean for the the folks who in in uh, across Africa who are just trying to make a, a a living extracting gold how does this affect them? Individuals, you've got a lot of. Uh restrictions that's going to be posed towards you specifically in, in the southern parts of South Africa, of Africa. Government wants their hands across all the commodities. They want control around each and every one of the commodities and they put restrictions on the movement of those commodities. They'll start at the very bottom where the smaller fish, they will say, you need to comply with certain levels of uh, operations in terms of your company, safety policies, legal procedures, various type of registrations. So the red tape there already will become extraordinary for you to fork out some a, 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 a fortune basically to start operating. Once you do start operating, and if you are fortunate through that process, you then need to overcome a hurdle where they'll be put on restrictions for you on the financial monetary movement of those commodities, as well as the taxes, the financial charges behind those commodities and ultimately if you are successful 
then there's just the other guy that's standing behind your shoulder that's looking at all the amounts of money that you're making as a small player in the market and unknown where they can take over and grow the business and this is where your assassinations and your crime starts on a frequent basis they take out the smaller fish and they start operating and producing much bigger volumes with their power and influence in involving only these commodities if you look at south africa specifically if you look at the current president of south africa if you look at prior to him becoming president he was involved in mining how did he get in mining it's his influences it's who he knew the type of relationship he's built and his fault and his family is still operating those businesses silently they still operating and making massive amounts of fortunes and that money if you look at all the corruption cases right now he's hiding dollars in the sofa investigations have taken place from the judiciary to find out why is he holding foreign currencies in south africa where is that case gone the investigation is thrown out the window they'll be cover up after cover up so irrespective of if you're a small guy unfortunately your your time of survival is very limited you need to build up influences with bigger players and try and make yourself as strong as possible in order to operate and that's the sad reality of of south africa and zimbabwe specifically if, if i could just jump in here as well morgan um i'm glad you brought up the um concerns about small scale miners and artisanal miners because that was one of the um, money laundering schemes that was offered to us by the diplomatic mafia. So basically, the first in our very first meeting with them, they got on the phone the president of the Miners Federation, Henrietta Rushuaya, who also happens to be the president's niece. And um, the money laundering scam scheme that she offers was for us to invest in our dirty money in a, um, to provide more tools to the small scale miners. And in return, we would get gold that could be flown to us anywhere in the world. So basically our dirty money would then be turned into gold flown out on planes and private chartered planes. And they said, you know, that this could go up to millions a week. So um, not only are they not protected, but they're basically used unknowingly as part of this larger um, scheme to launder money for those in power. And, and Dominic, um, you know, how do these schemes affect everyday Kenyans? What are what are the implications um, for just regular folks in your country? Uh, for, for, for regular folks, like during during that time, uh, 90, in, the, in the early 90s, uh assuming uh you wanted to trade you wanted to do business with dubai it was the kenyan central bank that dictated to you how much you can buy and how much can be given to you it, it was regulated that uh foreign exchange was not easily available to the common uh kenya so even exports and imports were dictated to by the government uh, uh because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, of money was being uh, siphoned by those in power, and and and, and it is it is government money. So the, the provision of services uh, at some point of time uh, we couldn't have we couldn't retire our civil servants. I mean, public servants could not be retired because there was no there were no resources for their retirement benefits. So instead of uh, initially the retirement age was fifty, it was extended to fifty five. And then it went further to uh, 60. So, so now for a retiree, it takes him longer to, uh, to, to retire and even to get those benefits. So this, the, the, the little normal services that you're supposed to get to, to, to get, the public is supposed to get from government, cannot be accessed because of that massive corruption, because a lot of uh, resources are being uh, diverted from where they're supposed to go, from, from, from uh, provision of, of, of medical facilities for improving education, uh, transport, and the likes of it. A lot of those resources are being diverted to be used for these schemes as opposed to what they're supposed to do for the public. So for, for a long time, uh, uh, the, the Kenyans had uh, 
Kenyan uh, public had, 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 had suffered to, to the extent that uh, when an election was called for a new president after 24 years of, of uh, governance under uh, uh, President Ernest Arap Moy, there was an overwhelming uh, revolt against his government that his preferred candidate had no chance of getting a vote that there was there was such a, a revolt against uh, his his governance his government that uh somebody who a, a candidate who had tried uh presidency for a long time was voted in overwhelmingly across uh, across the board because uh in kenya politics is 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 is, is uh, dictated by ethnic uh, regional and likes of it but this president was voted in by the whole lot of kenyans because kenyans were tired of the corruption and what had been happening all this time so they wanted to get rid of that system and then bring in a new one hope hoping that that would change uh, the way things are run in the country but as it is uh it's same forest different monkeys we're just seeing the same things happening over and over again I think we might have time for just one more question. Um, you know, we, I think because of the uh, the widespread publicity around blood diamonds, I think people started talking more about uh, the implications of the, of the diamond industry. Um, you know, Sarah, in your film, you talk about how gold is melted down so often that we really don't know at this point whether like whether here on my gold wedding ring whether i'm wearing dirty gold or or whether this is some you know it, it is uh it uh, obtained through um you know legitimate means uh not at the cost of of corruption or the destruction of people's lives um and so our, our last question really from the audience is like what is we what can we as just regular citizens do around the world um one to not be a party to um this type of corruption but also what can we do to try to help combat it uh yeah i agree morgan um that's one thing that came up a lot that gold is the current preferred currency for criminals just because it's so easy to melt down and then its origins are erased if we think about it every bit of gold that has ever been mined still exists in the world today is in some form and um it's it's surprising i guess how unregulated the industry really is these um enablers or these uh gold mafia were actually telling us that to for this to work for these operations to work what you need to have is a refinery because once you have that you have control over everything um and that's the that's the belief that you know under the lbma the london um uh, which you know believes that it controls or sets the industry standard for gold um that refiners should be the gatekeepers of uh gold to make sure the origins of gold are not conflict gold or um in, you know from questionable uh, mines and you know unsafe mines but unless there is political will to implement that on the refiners. There's not really a way to gatekeep that because once it's melted down, once it enters the international market, there's no telling where it's come from or where it's going to go. That's true. And and what is it you know beyond the gold industry needing to kind of self-regulate? Um, what would what what should be our action items for th those of us who really were just so um, blown away by your film? Um, what should we be trying to do? I guess spread the word, which I'm hoping that we're doing here. Uh, but is there anything else that that we can do to to support Dominic's work, to support Dawood's whistleblowing, and, and to support the the extraordinary uh, endeavor that you've undertaken here with Gold Mafia? Absolutely, like organizations like Disrupt Films and you know the Museum of Political Corruption, and you know all these international bodies that are there. I think protection of whistleblowers is of utmost importance. It is the bedrock for all investigative journalism, and for work, the good work that you know journalists like Dominic does. Um, I, as you know, I have the privilege of physical distance 
and that means that I am able to, you know, go home and feel safe at the end of the day. But that's not the case for many people who do the hard work, like Dominic and my other colleagues. So, you know, protection of media, protection of journalists and whistleblowers, the more that we can do for them, uh, we're all going to benefit from it. Basically, and one thing that we do try to do in getting impact is, if you know, we we try to name names, we try to name companies, we try to, because if we can't go through, if we can't rely on certain judicial systems, at least we can hit them where it hurts most, which is where where the money flows. Uh, well. You know, as you said, Sarah, uh, investigative journalists are are practically nowhere without the courage of whistleblowers, um, and we really should honor the the courage of, of people like Dawood, um, Dominic. Uh, you know, I really urge people to support investigative journalism and independent media, not just in the United States but around the world. And I know from my own work in the continent that even a small contribution to the work of someone like Dominic can go a long way. Uh, so I really urge you to help support investigative journalism in, in Africa. And um, and I just hope everybody will spread the work, uh, a word about Sarah and, and Alex's extraordinary film. It really, um, it's it's shocking. Uh, and, and it's one that deserves to have a, a great outsized impact um, because the journalism that you've done and, and just the confessions that you've uh, evinced from your reporting is just really amazing. And, uh, and I hope everyone too will support the Museum of Political Corruption, uh, both the Disrupt series and its larger work, because um, as I said, I think that the mother of all our problems is political corruption. And when you see, for instance, one of the largest climate change summits in the world being used really as a pretense for self-enrichment through the illicit gold trade, it brings into focus what are really the driving factors uh, for regimes across the world um, that operate uh, under you know, these corrupt principles. So uh, Dominic, Dawood, Sarah, thank you all for your work and thank you for joining the Museum of Political Corruption and the Disrupt series. Thank you so much, thank Morgan. You. Thanks guys. <laughs>
I hope you have enjoyed our program and I look forward to seeing you all again next year as we return with our Disruption Series featuring more impactful films and powerful conversations. And as we conclude the Museum of Political Corruption 2023's programming, we wish you all a safe, peaceful and just new year. Thank you and happy holidays. <laughs>